let's assume that I buy in because quite honestly, this has been always been my problem with game B is that I look at the, I look at the game theory and I look at our, our history in terms of what has brought us to this, this point. And I would say that if you believe any version of the theory of natural and sexual selection, you'd have to say that we are the product of an arms race. And the idea that we would be wise enough to stop the arms race when I, I can hear in my mind's ear, all these people saying, wow, chicken little is at it again. Everything's great. We, you know, Steven Pinker tells us that we were in a much more peaceful world. Uh, we won the cold war. What are you guys going on about? I mean, things are a little bit screwy in politics and, and suddenly it's all gloom and doom. I, I just, I hear that voice. And then I hear this other voice, which is this optimism about maybe we could become wise. Maybe we could become the people wise enough to have synthetic biology and nuclear weapons and instant communication and data warfare and all these things and survive and thrive. And I don't see, help, help me out. Where is the hope here? I, I think that you and I probably don't need to talk about this much, but that what I would call a naive techno optimism um, is bananas. Cherry picking data is easy from a big data set. Well, and the great negative externality is potential violence. As long as you don't see potential violence as having increased. Um, now, I, 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 then you don't see the problem. One argument you could make is that sublethal technology uh, has increased. Our ability to shoot beanbags at protesters means that you don't actually have to kill protesters. You know, that there, there are some weird arguments, but what you, you never lost the ability to kill them. You just may have not outfitted uh, riot police with uh, lethal technology in their first in the first wave of things that you send against uh, an unruly crowd. And the most awesome thing like about the current system is we don't even have to deal with protesters with tear gas or bean bags or whatever, mostly because mostly um, addiction and student debt and information overwhelm and those things deal with the people adequately. Um, so they, they don't actually understand enough or care enough or have the capacity to organize very meaningfully. We just legalize weed and make porn free and everyone's demotivated. Those are a couple examples. Okay. Um, I think we need to talk about- You make about, it sound like a good thing. Like maybe, maybe it's keeping this no, society from going critical. No, no, no. Um, I'm saying that every dominant system has an intrinsic propensity to s figure out how to stay being the dominant system, which okay. means that it has a intrinsic propensity to get better at being able to deal with dissent. And um, we can look at different kinds of conflict theory. You and Peter were talking about Girardian conflict. We can look at this as kind of a Marxist class type conflict, but I think it's it's deeper than that. The system that is self-perpetuating is inanimate. The system, which is self-perpetuating, is not itself animate or sentient. But it is autopoetic. But it is autopoetic. And this is the fascinating thing to get is it's like, it, let's take let's take Nick Bostrom's paperclip maximizer mm -hmm. as an analogy. So I know you know this, but for the people who don't, um, when looking at concerning AI risk scenarios, one of them is this, you know, kind of funny idea of a paperclip maximizer. Paperclip is representative of any widget. So make an AI that basically can do two things. It can optimize the production of something here, a paperclip. And so it can use its intelligence to do that. So it can make more efficient supply chains and whatever. And it can use its intelligence to increase its own intelligence. So you'll get an, a exponential curve on intelligence, which also then means an exponential curve on its capacity to optimize whatever narrow metric it's optimizing. And so, of course, after it just makes increases in efficiency, which are awesome, then it starts making so many paper clips that it needs new substrate to make paper clips right. out of. And it eventually turns the whole world into paper clips because it can 
it can grow its intelligence to outcompete whoever's competing for those paper clips faster than they can. That's a very short version of it. You're going to say something. Well, just, I guess what I find very bizarre about all of this is that I live in multiple social worlds and intellectual worlds. And in some of my worlds, this stuff strikes people as loopy. Oh, here comes the stuff about the AGI. The robots are going to kill us all. And in some other portion of my world, it's like, well, clearly we're, we're on the verge of AGI and that's going to be the existential risk. And this is in part to go back to your original point and something that you and I share a failure, a catastrophic failure of, of communal sense making, right? So what I've claimed is, is that the revolution that we're in is, is based around the idea that we don't have what I've called semi-reliable communal sense making. We can't all agree now, even right. if it's slightly wrong or maybe even deeply wrong as to what it is that we're seeing where we are in human history, what our issues are. And so the first part of this decision tree that goes really wrong is that a lot of people think that we're in great shape. Okay. So this is, I, I'm actually going to come back to the paperclip max magic because it explains why we don't have communal sense making. If instead of thinking about an artificial intelligence that can increase its capacity while optimizing something, we think of a collective intelligence that can, some way that humans are processing information together in a group. A market is a kind of collective intelligence, right? The whole idea of what the invisible hand of the market, the, the market will figure out what stuff people really want. It's expressed as demand and then which version of the various supplies is best. The, I wouldn't say it's, a, it's an intelligence. It's not a central intelligence, but the idea is that there is kind of an emergent intelligence. There is an emergent property of this thing. And, you know, it computes things like prices and allocations. And if that's what you mean by intelligence, then I'll... That's what I mean. Okay. Yeah. So it's, it is a bottom-up coordination system that does end up having new information emerge as the result of the bottom-up coordination. Okay. And I can take a market as a, as kind of at the center. I can take capitalism at the center of the more general class of what I would call rivalrous dynamics as a whole as a kind of collective intelligence. Okay. Because the thing that wins at the game of rivalry gets selected for. And so there is this kind of learning of how to get better at rivalrous games. Learning across the system as a whole. Which, th which things win in war, which things keep more people believing the thing, which keep people from attriting out of the thing like that. Does that make sense? Yes. And so I would say that we have, if we just take the capitalism part, capitalism is a paperclip maximizer that is converting the natural world and human resources into capital while getting better at doing so. So it goes from barter to currency, to fiat currency, to fractional reserve process, to complex financial instruments, to high-speed trading on those. Those are like the increase in its capacity to do that. But specifically, now it is a incentive for all the humans to do certain things. So if leaving the whale alive in the ocean confers no economic advantage on me, but killing it and selling it as meat is a million dollars of economic advantage, and if I don't kill it, the whale still won't be alive because somebody else is going to kill it anyways. And then that they might actually even use that economic power against me. Now I've got, I have an incentive system that is encouraging all the humans to behave in certain kinds of ways. And now not only do we need to kill the whales, we need to race at getting better to do it and making better militaries and extracting all the resources. And so I see this as a kind of. So if I'm understanding where you're headed what you're saying is is that the market is kind of a precursor to an agi it is a collective intelligence mm -hmm. that is eventually self-terminating in the same way that a cancer is right the cancer cells are self-replicating and they're growing faster than normal cells but they end up killing the host which kills themselves and so the the reason I'm bringing this up in terms of collective sense making is those who do the will of capitalism, like the, those who do the will of the paperclip maximizer, Moloch, or on whatever kind of analogy we want to use here, 
those who do well at the game of power get more power. And then they use that legislative power, media power, capital power to make systems that to modify the systems in ways that help them more, right? Those who oppose the system of power also oppose those who are doing well at it. So even though the system is inanimate, the people who are doing well at it are animate. So then they take those people out, which is we see how Martin Luther King and Gandhi and Jesus and et cetera died, people who actually opposed the system of power. Right. And so you end up having a system that is selecting for or, or is conferring more power to those who are good at getting more power, which ends up meaning who are selecting for conferring power to sociopathy. Yeah, I I don't find this part of the argument. Well, maybe I'm just stuck somewhere, Dana. Okay. So let me be, be, I mean, I think I'm on your side, so I want to help make a different part of this case. Okay. I think a lot of this comes down to magical thinking because of the non-use of nuclear weapons uh, against humans <laughs> since 1945. I think that one thing if 9-11 had been a nuclear attack rather than a weird conventional attack, we would know where we were in human history. And by virtue of our luck and our luck alone, we are completely confused as to how perilous the present moment is because our luck has been amazing. And if you believe... Surprising. Yeah. If you believe that somehow it can't be luck because it's this good then you believe that there's some unknown principle keeping us safe and it you don't know what the name of that principle is maybe it's human ingenu in ingenuity maybe it's um, some sort of secret collective that keeps the world uh sensible maybe it's that markets have tied us all together i don't know what your story is yeah but whatever your story is it's wrong and it's it's obviously wrong Right. The, the, the idea that we didn't have anything like 9-11 and then we had a sudden 9-11 kind of attack is itself paradigmatic that these things with which you have no data familiarity. I mean, look, there was no suicide bombing in the right. modern world before the 1980s. And I think this is the point is that... Um, it's generally more advantageous within a market to believe that markets are good and the world is healthy and things are awesome. Right. I, I'll usually do better in academia if I say academia is good, right? Which is a point that you make. If I really criticize it heavily, I'm going to get less tenure. This is Peter's point more than my point. Okay. Yeah. I will usually do better in markets if I say they're awesome and do better in a corporation if I say it's awesome. And so there is kind of an incentive for optimism about the dominant system if I want to do well in the dominant system. And if I have critiques of the dominant system, I'm usually going to do less well in it, which means less power will get conferred to those ideas. And so there's kind of a mimetic selection, right? Like the memes that that do well end up being the memes that propagate, but do well within a current system. Well, the, look, this is why I've called for uh, a return to above ground nuclear testing, because my belief is, is that we... <laughs> You laugh, but I'm not kidding. I, around. I mean, if we don't get, get our amygdalas really engaged with where we are, this magical thinking, which by the way, I suffer from this magical thing. I'm not, it's not something that I'm claiming everyone else has. I have the idea that nothing too bad can, can come that, you know, I always ask this, this weird question, which is how many foreign nuclear devices are currently on us soil. People always think about that nukes will have to come through an ICBM. I'm not at all convinced that that would have to be true. People just don't think about these things because we've been in such a rare period of time that these things haven't, like everybody who's yeah. talked in these terms, sort of to me, like there's a part of me that sounds like, okay, well, that's the kind of a conversation you have on, on a dorm uh, floor during a bull session. Like grownups realize that something is keeping the world together. Which is funny, right? Because it's basically saying, Grown-ups have bought into magical thinking 